Chapter 7 Platonic Ideas and Heredity Though experience coming from the outer world affects the mind through the senses, yet the way this experience is seized and combined is largely given by the mind itself. There is, as we have already said, a subjective element in all knowledge, and without it there can be no knowledge. This subjective element may arise from previous experience, as when we recognize the hare sitting in its form in a distant field because we have already seen other hares so sitting, perhaps much nearer. The mind is ready, as it were, to take the required shape and attitude, and may do so even under doubtful or misleading circumstances, because it has taken the sh same shape and attitude so often before. And we can hardly doubt that through heredity also, in some way, as well as through our own individual experience, the mind acquires the habit of making certain combinations and interpretations of the outer world. But it is also obvious that there is a great deal on the subjective side of knowledge, which is given antecedently to all experience, hereditary or individual. As when the sense of likeness or difference arises, or of size or of number, or when so many taps on the ear combine to a musical sound, or so many vibrations in the optic nerve to the impression of blue or red, or when sounds combine to a sense of harmony or of melody, or when certain vibrations and agitations of the body coalesce to the emotion of fear, or other vibrations and agitations to love, or when certain perceptions group together give rise to the sense of justice, or of truth, or of beauty. In all these cases, though the mental state thus produced may grow from small beginnings and by means of experience, yet it is in a sense prior to experience. That is to say, it is inconceivable that a succession of taps on the drum of the ear should be combined into one and heard as a single musical sound, unless the power of so combining taps was in the mind prior to experience. Or it is clear that two sounds might go on side by side in the ear forever, and not be heard as harmony, unless the mind added to the two that third and separate thing, which is the sense of their harmony. Certainly the sense of harmony might at first be felt in some very simple relation of two notes, and afterwards might grow and be extended to much more remote and multiplex relations. But all the same, it would from the first be an original synthesis contributed from within. So of the sense of likeness or difference, in whatever undeveloped mind or of infant or animal, it first occurs to feel that two experiences not only are each what they are, but that they are like or unlike each other. The new experience of likeness or unlikeness, is something added by the mind. It represents a new power or faculty developed, and totally unlike all its former powers and faculties. So again, when a great number of inchoate movements in the tissues and nerves of the body, and agitations of the muscles, organs, and secretions, with the internal sensations they convey, are all combined in one emotion of fear, or another set of movements and sensations in one emotion of love. These emotions are totally different from the sensations and movements so combined. They are something added by the mind to the group of sensations. They are its way of seizing and combining the group. Lastly, certain groups of experiences excite in our minds the sense of justice or of truth or of beauty but we are utterly unable to conceive that these great ideas are in the separate experiences or events themselves, but they are our way of looking at them, our feeling with regard to them. I have insisted on the aspect of all these things as feelings. They are sensations, emotions, states, or affections of the mind. They are the qualities given by the mind to its various combinations of experience. 
time, space, and causality, said Kant, are universal forms or qualities of the understanding, conditions of our perceptions of outer experience. But, we may say, redness, blueness, sound, heat, similarity, order, harmony, love, justice, beauty, etc., are qualities given by the mind still deeper down and projected by it into the world of space, time, and causality. They are the names for feelings, states, or ideas, if we like to call them so, aboriginal and primitive in the mind itself. And here comes in a most important point, the distinction, namely, between the two aspects of each of these things, the inner or the outer, the emotional or the intellectual, the synthetic or the analytic, the neglect of which distinction has been the cause of endless confusion. In fact, we see that each of these affections, the experience of a musical sound, for example, or of similarity, or of justice, is on one side a perfectly simple and undecomposable feeling, while on the other side it resolves itself into a relation, possibly quite complex, between objects. Thus the sound of a violin string is on its inner and deeper side a simple and unique sensation, but in its more external and analytic aspect it appears as a series of vibrations of very complex form, falling in a particular way on the ear. Similarity is, from one point of view, a simple state or affection of the mind. From the other, it figures out in the form of multiplex relations between objects. So of justice. On the one side, all the labyrinthine detail of statues and statutes and courts of law. On the other, a severe unique sentiment. Herbert Spencer has a long and eloquent passage in which he shows analytically, and from the intellectual side, the vast complexity of love. Dr. Buck says that love is a perfectly simple moral state, defying analysis. It is obvious that unless we recognize the two-sidedness of these mental states, we are liable to be landed in the utmost confusion. Let us call such a mental state, following the nomenclature of Plato, but perhaps somewhat extending it, which on its inner side appears as a simple quality or feeling, but on its outer side is a structure more or less complex, an idea. Then the units of the mind's operations are such ideas, which on one side are relations and on the other side are simple, structureless feelings. But it is to be noted that the latter side seems to be the more intimate and essential, because the same feeling may be associated with more than one set of relations, as when the sense of harmony in music is provoked by more than one chord, or the sense of injustice by various possible relations between folk. There is another point which must be noted, the structure of ideas with regard to one another. Thus, to take the case of music, to which we have so often referred, taps on the ear combine to the sensation or idea of sound, but the sensations of sound combine to the idea of harmony or of melody. Harmonies and melodies again combine to a much more complex structure, a musical phrase. This structure in its turn wakes an emotion, which is, as it were, the other side of it. Whenever we hear the phrase, the same emotion recurs. Finally, a whole series of phrases, with their accompanying emotions, make up a musical piece, which excites in us some still grander synthesis and sense of beauty or truth or freedom. Let us suppose the composer's mind filled with the sense of beauty taking some definite form then that single idea, in his mind, generates the whole musical piece. For it first of all regulates the balance and structure of the component emotions of the piece. Each of these emotions, in its turn, determines the musical phrase, which expresses it. The harmonies and melodies, again, needful for the musical phrase, 
determine the various relations to each other of the single notes, and lastly, the single notes determine the number of air vibrations necessary for their production. Thus the whole complex of mechanical air vibration is generated and determined by the single idea or feeling of beauty in the composer's mind, acting through lesser and subordinate ideas, and vice versa. The public listening to the complex of air vibrations is led up again step by step to the realization of and participation in that same root idea which from the beginning was responsible for its generation. Whoever clearly follows this concatenation and subordination of ideas and their creative power has already come a long way towards understanding not only the generation of a musical piece, but the generation and creation of all nature and human life. For the instant a new idea or synthesis is manifested, say in the mind of a child, and the instant can often be observed, or in an adult mind, whether it be the simple idea of number, or of harmony, or of truth, or what not, it determines both observation and action, it guides as to what we shall perceive and as to how we shall act. Take the sense of order coming to a child. The moment of this happening may often be noticed. The new perception of what order means and the new feeling of pleasure in it. The two together constitute the idea of order. And at once the child sees new facts in the world around it and arranges its life and belongings anew. Thus again, if the idea of justice is present among a people, though it may be but a sentiment at first, and on its inner side, yet quickly on its outer side it gives itself structure and regulates the conflicting desires and emotions and needs of the people. And these emotions and desires, so regulated from above, do each of them in their turn generate and regulate groups of habits and customs and these again, each in their turn, innumerable individual acts, and so the idea of justice becomes creative and alive throughout the whole state. Plato, as is well known, gave to ideas in some such sense as this the greatest import. They existed before the world, and the world was created after their pattern. See the Timaeus. And we can see from what has already been said that they are somehow implicit in the ego before all experience. As they descend into operation and consciousness within the man, they shape his life and form, and through him again the outer world. Thus there is a point in evolution undoubtedly when the thought and feeling of selfness emerges in the child or the monkey, or another point when the idea of courage dawns on the early man or the growing boy, and instantly, in each case, we see what immense vistas of life and forms of life and action, what different ramifications and institutions of society proceed from one such inner birth. With Plato, the great ruling ideas were justice, temperance, beauty, and the like but he also considered that there were ideas or patterns, eternal in the heavens, of all tribes and creatures in the world, as of trees, animals, men, and the lesser gods. And he even went so far as to suppose ideas of things made by man's artifice, such as beds and tables. Certainly it sounds a little comic at first to hear the, quote, absolute essential bed spoken of, and Plato has been considerably berated by many folk for his daring in this matter. He has been accused of confounding the idea of a bed with the concept of a bed. It has been said, too, that if there are ideas of beds and tables, trees and animals, there must also be archetypes in heaven of pots and pans, absolutely essential worms, beetles and toadstools, and so forth. Plato, however, had no doubt considered these difficulties, and it may be worth while for our purpose to pause a moment over them. If it were the mere concept of a bed, 
it would, of course, be absurd to give it any essential reality. For the concept is a mere intellectual abstraction, derived from, from the perception of a great number of actual beds, and is certainly less real than the things of which it is, so to speak, a rough sketch. But the idea, as we have said, though it may have intellectual structure on its outer side, is on its inner side essentially a feeling. It is the feeling of bed which constitutes the idea and is creative. Now in man there is essentially such a feeling, a need and desire of sleep and the horizontal position. How deep this feeling may root in the nature of man, it might be hard to say, but we can see that it is very, very profound, and from it spring all imaginable actual beds, of most various shape and construction, yet all in their ways adapted and giving form to that feeling. I say the idea of bed, in this sense, is rooted most deep and far back in the nature of man, but man himself and his nature is rooted deep in the nature of God, from whom he springs, and so may we not say that in some sense the idea of bed is rooted in the ultimate reality and nature of things. When we see how things like beds and tables and houses may thus spring from needs or ideas, like rest and shelter, lying deep in the very constitution of man, it is not difficult to see further how the forms of man's body and of the animals and trees and worms and beetles and toadstools, may have been, to a large extent, determined and created by the feelings or ideas slumbering within these beings. At some point the feeling of pleasure and safety in arboreal life lent form and outline to the whole race of prehensile monkeys. At some other point the sweet sensation of contrast between the moist darkness of the earth and the sunlit air of heaven, gave birth to the vast tribe of vegetable beings. Forever seeking by upward and downward ramifications to extend the glad interchange between the two worlds. That these creative feelings did not appear to the individual animals and vegetables concerned as vast and luminous, quote, ideas, but only as dim, semi-conscious desires, does not affect the argument that in this way creation has been affected. Nor do I wish to say that this is quite the way in which Plato conceives the subject. It is more like the conception of Schopenhauer. But anyhow, it is an attempt to show how the Platonic ideas may be brought into some sort of line and harmony with modern science and philosophy and it enables us dimly to see how the great panorama of creation has come forth, ever determining and manifesting itself from within, through the disclosure from point to point, and from time to time, of ever new creative feelings or ideas, the whole forming an immense hierarchy, culminating in the grandest, most universal being and life. Here, in the contemplation of this universal being, this primal self of all, we are at the source of creation. In this primal self, and its first differentiation, we may suppose to exist great primitive ideas, attitudes, aspects, things below or more fundamental than feeling, which yet work out into feeling, thought, and action. These ideas are working everywhere, in the great self and in every lesser self that springs therefrom. And our lives are their expression, differently mingled though they be in each person, and always, owing to the conflict of existence, inadequately expressed. In quite inorganic nature we still perceive ideas of a certain class pervading matter, like attraction or repulsion, rigidity or fluidity, rest or motion which, as we have noticed before, answer to feelings which we have within ourselves. In more organic nature we recognize life, sensitiveness, selfness, affection, and in our fellow man ideas of courage, justice, beauty, and so forth. Everywhere in creation we see ideas working, 
which answer more or less to those within ourselves. And it is this answering of one to the other, of the outer to the inner, which forms the very ground of all science and art, and the joy that we feel in truth and beauty. But in the race, too, as well as in the individual, these ideas are working, and in fact it is through the race, largely, that they gradually gain their form and expression. This consideration must detain us a moment, as it is important. The feelings, which are an essential part of ideas, may be innate in the human mind, and the cap capacity for them may be universal. But the forms corresponding may vary greatly from race to race. The feeling of number, or of melody, or of justice, may be universal in mankind, but the ar arithmetical systems, or the diatonic scales, or the social institutions of the various races, may be very various. The abstract feeling of number, then, or of melody, or of justice, may correspond to the idea of Plato, formless in the heavens, or in the bosom of God. But when it comes to take form in the various races of mankind, it does so with variety, according to the necessity of outward circumstances and the genius and tradition of each race. Thus Plato feigns in the Timaeus that the universal spirit of God handed over the seeds of the immortal, imperishable ideas to the lesser gods, who, each according to the race of men or animals over which he presided, was to embody these seeds in external forms. Thus the various races of living creatures arose, all vivified from within by the eternal ideas, yet all having their various structures according to their races, and the genius of the particular god presiding over the race. In the language of modern science, using the term heredity to cover much the same ground as the genius of the race god, we should say that while the ideas, say of melody and of flight in the case of birds, are the vivifying impulses of any class of creatures, the particular forms, as of songs and of wings, are a matter of slowly growing heredity and the tradition of the race. Let us take the example of courage in man. At a certain stage in evolution, doubtless, the idea of courage dawned on primitive man. He may have fought in a scrambling, spasmodic way before that, but without any nucleus to his ardor. Now round this new idea, this new sense, a distinct life grew. He admired courage in others, he strove for it in himself, and it took form. The idea, which in the abstract, or in heaven, may be formless enough, took form, and became embodied in a certain type of man, according to the race, according to its tradition, according to its needs and environment. The physical and moral type of courage in the mind of a Greek, the dress, the figure, the temperament, the character, would be very different from that in the mind of a North American Indian, and that again from the type in the mind of a modern soldier. The form, depending on more or less traceable external conditions, but the feeling being one which comes to all races and men at a certain stage of growth. Thus heredity comes in, the ancestors having all been accustomed to associate courage with a certain type of man and action, we can hardly doubt that in some way the repeated impressions cohere in the descendant, or at least leave the descendant mind the more ready to respond to that particular type. Till in the course of centuries and thousands of years, a particular form rouses a particular feeling with the greatest intensity or, on the other hand, a feeling calls up a particular form. The modern boy sees in a red-coat soldier an emblem of superhuman valor, when a befeathered Apache brave would only fill him with contempt and ridicule. Thus the creative idea, through heredity and individual experience combined, works in this or that form, in this or that race, 
though in the course of centuries, with changing circumstances or development, the form too may slowly change. Or we may take the example of love, how of this inner feeling a certain external type of woman, owing to the genius and heredity and circumstances of the race, may become the emblem and ideal, how this type may figure as the goddess of love for the race, and become a great power in the midst of it. Or again, justice, how certain institutions getting ingrained by heredity and race habit, as associated with this sentiment, acquire a great sacredness and authority, and are most difficult to alter, though to other races or folk they may seem quite horrible. Or even of beds and tables, how the idea of a bed in one race may work itself out in a ponderous four-poster, and in another in a simple mat on the ground, and in a third in the form of a hammock. Though the feeling and need of sleep may be practically the same in all races, yet the forms and structures in which it finds expression may be so different as to be almost meaningless and useless to those unaccustomed to them. Thus we get a glimpse of great formative ideas lying even behind the evolution of races, and largely guiding these evolutions, subject of course to external influences and such things as the clashing of the ideas of one race with those of another. And we see how the expression of ideas through the long race life and the repetition of them in the same form may gain an extraordinary intensity, a subject to which we shall return in the next chapter. We see, too, in what way Plato was justified in saying that the ideas were the real things and the mundane objects only elusive forms. For clearly the hammock and the mat and the four-poster, and all the countless variations of these are, none of them, the absolute essential bed or bedness, but rather this term must be applied to that profound quality of man's nature from which all mortal beds proceed. And clearly all the horribly discordant law books and laws and law courts and prisons are none of them justice. But this term must be applied to that deep sentiment, of which all these are the lame expression. Quote, For nothing can have any sense except by reason of that of which it is the shadow. And finally, we may ask whether, for a true understanding of the trees and the plants and the animals, we must not refer them, in the similar way, to the root ideas and feelings from which they spring and of which they strive to be the expression. To recapitulate, the creative source is in the transcendent self of all things. This self at its first differentiation into multiplex, quote, aspects, or individualities, manifests at the same time the ideas which are inherent in its being. And these again descend into feeling, thought, and action, and finally into external structure and life, which latter may be looked upon as largely due to the conditioning or limitation of the ideas manifested in one individuality by those manifested in another. Anyhow, we can see that the manifestation takes place under certain external conditions, and that by the time it descends into actual structure, it has been largely swayed by those conditions. These external forms built up in any race, for the manifestation or expression of ideas, are riveted and emphasized by heredity, or by the hammering of the race god, through the centuries, and acquire an extraordinary sanctity and transcendent glamour through this process, so that the mere appearance of the form instantly wakes the idea or deep transcendent feeling which belongs to it. Thus we come near to Plato's idea and see how a kind of memory of celestial visions and powers may be roused by the sight of mortal things. We see, too, that the self of one race, having branched off somewhere from the primal self, may embody or manifest the ideas in somewhat different degree or different order, say, from the self of another race. 
and again that the individual ego, branching from the race ego, though it carries on the general forms and ideas of the race, may manifest them in different degree or combination from another individual. Yet it has to be remembered that the absolute self of the individual is still ultimately the transcendent world self, coming down in time through the race self, but by no means necessarily tied to the race forms, and that the individual, notwithstanding his heredity, has still an access and appeal to a region and powers beyond and prior to all heredity. <laughs>